I have uh, known Brother Ken Bailey for, uh, well, I guess, a number of years, but I uh, know him uh, much better during a recent trip to England for the, the England uh, lectures. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's just a normal guy. <laughs> he, uh, some people don't think that, but uh, he really is. He, he, uh, he exhibits great uh, levity. He's, he doesn't take himself all that ser seriously, but, you know, he does take one thing seriously, and that is the uh, truth that is contained in the New Testament. And he uh, will oppose those who want to compromise the truth. And I really appreciate him for that uh, stand that he takes. He's a uh, excellent gospel preacher. And what I find surprising is that he's been at the uh, preacher of Lower City for 24 years, for 24 years, same place. And that's, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> 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 Oh, uh, well, I'm glad they decided to keep him, but uh, he's, uh, um, he's been edu educated at Louisville College and Tennessee Bible College. Tennessee Bible College? Yeah. He's a close a cohort of Malcolm Hill, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know if he's your mentor or what. I just didn't know. But, but he's been preaching for uh, 31 years, and of course, you know, as I said, he's the uh, preacher at uh, North City and one of the elders at of North City uh, Church of Christ, and he's a staff writer, uh, a, uh, well, I say staff writer, he contributes regularly to the Continuing for the Faith uh, paper, and we certainly appreciate that. He's experienced in radio and TV work. He uh, uh, is one of the speakers of What Does the Bible Say? It's a TV broadcast in Jackson, Mississippi, and he's also a law enforcement officer. I think he's on reserve duty right now, but uh, he is a law enforcement officer, and he's written um, manuscripts for, for various lectureship books, including this one. And he's married to the former Judy White House, and they have one adult daughter, Meredith Hope. She resides in Chattanooga. So uh, we certainly are uh, blessed to be able to hear him tonight on a, a topic should organizational error in a church disrupt uh, fellowship between Christians. I think you'll find his uh, presentation uh, to the point and of great uh, interest to a brotherhood that needs it. Come speak to us. It's indeed a pleasure to be here this evening, to be with you, to be part of this lectureship. I'd like to thank the elders. I have a great love and regard for invitation to be here. I want to express appreciation to David and Jody for having me in their home. Uh, they have been very gracious hosts, and I'm very appreciative of that. And I appreciate all the good, delicious food that we've had that makes all of us a little more widely throughout the brotherhood. I look forward to coming down down to get to eat with well, It's a great pleasure on my part. Uh, I was playing a game several years ago called psychology. That's why it gets in a big circle and they take the psychologist out and you, the patients are in a big circle and, and they tell you, you just pretend like you're the person left of you. They can ask you any question they want and you just answer the way you think the person would answer to the left of you. And uh, I was sitting to the left of one fellow and they asked him, he said, what's your hobby? And he said, eating. So, but I try not to be too big of a pig, but it's always good. It's always good to come down and to be part of the lectureship here. The Church of Christ stands firmly grounded in the love and the purpose of God. As we study the Testament of Ephesians in particular, we will find that certainly the New Testament church plays within the eternal mystery the purpose of God a means by which men through the cross of Christ can be riled unto the Lord and give God glory in the way that God would church glorify him. In the book of Ephesians chapter 3, 21, Paul says unto him, Be glory the church, but Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. In Ephesians this chapter, verses 15 and 16, 
Paul writes, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make it himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 21 through 23, Paul writes, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church plays an important role in the scheme of redemption. The church does not save people. However, in its it's universal, and the church is comprised and composed of all who obey the gospel and who are in a saved relationship with Christ. One cannot understand the eternal purpose of God, and one can't truly understand the nature of God's love without understanding the nature of the Lord's church. And while we look at that from a universal perspective, and rightly so, See, we're going to be dealing with a subject entitled in the form of a question, should organization occur in the Lord's church called disruption of faith between Christians? My response to that is yes. Not because we enjoy division. Not because we want to be divisive by our attitude, but because of a stand for truth and because of the controversial nature of truth and because of the important Bible authority and because the importance placed upon correctly ascertaining Bible authority, and because we understand that that which is not authorized is sinful, as per Second John verses 9 through 11, and Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, organizational error is a deviation of the New Testament pattern, and therefore when it comes to organizational error in the local church, such would be sinful. This evening as we give an affirmative answer to that question, we want to, first of all, lay some groundwork by noting the sacrifices of Paul as demonstrated scriptures and the sacrifices Paul had to make certainly demonstrates the supremacy of the local church. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, and beginning in verse 20, Paul writes, For you suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smile on, on the face, or if, if a man smite, on a, on, smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach as though we uh, had been weak. Howbeit, whensoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So, so am I. Are they the name? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent. That's oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I shipwreck a night and a day. I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils and waters, in perils perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils of heathen, in from the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, and those things about that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." I'd like for you to underscore two words in this particular text this evening. If you don't want to mark in your Bible, it'll underscore these words in your mind. First of all, I'd like for you to emphasize and underscore that word care. That word is translated from a Greek word that is traded and that's with reference to being drawn in different directions, care to be taken of, care for a thing, care or piety. Paul had anxiety for brethren, and he had anxiety for brethren from the perspective in a local collective functioning unit on as churches. Now that word church, ecclesia, is put here in the in the plural, ecclesion, and it speaks with reference to called out assemblies. 
And when you look, the New Testament teaches regarding these called out assemblies, you will find that they were uh, simply more than just mobs. They weren't just people in a disorganized cell group. They were local assemblies that had organization. They had specified work assigned to them. They would carry out in a collective fashion a job that God had intended for them to accomplish. And because of the importance of the work that these locals had given them, we find thus that these local churches are important because God expected them in collective fashion to accomplish these particular works. Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. There's one passage I'd like for us to look at. Actually, there's going to be two more along with these, but perhaps as we synchronize these and put, the, put these passages together, see the, the look, uh, the, the, the example of Paul, uh, the, the writing that Paul gives us here as he's inspired of the Holy Spirit, how he demonstrates the supremacy of a local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all say the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. God did not want the church at Corinth to be in a state of division. He wanted them to be unified, but he also wanted them to have to used upon that of truth, not upon compromise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, within verse 17, that Paul says, For the laws have I sent unto you to Mobius, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul was teaching the same message in every local church. And then we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, we find that God, through Paul, the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write, but as God had distributed to every man, as the Lord had called everyone, so let him walk, and so I ordain in all churches. Paul has instruction that would apply to all the large New Testament churches. Those are local congregations. Because the church is ordered after a divine pattern, the church of the Lord, whether it be in its universal extension or whether it be in its local extension, is something that is very important. And as we understand the nature of the church and as we understand the function of the church, the church as it functions, functions upon a local basis, through a local government, locally, autonomously, independently, and it functions at local capacity according to the divine pattern. Because there is a divine pattern to follow, because there is a need to follow instruction as God has, has placed upon his churches in their local functioning capacity, we find thus that the organization as set forth in the New Testament regarding the local church, is of crucial importance. Well, what would be the New Testament model of local churches? We don't want to take a great deal of time talking about this because if we do, we will lose time and really not get to the point we're wanting to make regarding the various or some various eras that's taught regarding that of the local church and its organized status. But we find, first of all, that the church at Philippi was organized, as all scripturally. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, it had a scripturally appointed leadership, that of elders. The elders were the overseers of that church at Philippi, as in all local churches that function according to the New Testament pattern. Because of the Ephesus, Acts chapter 20 in verse 28, we find that the New Testament churches is in the New Testament was entrusted to the care of the elders of those local churches. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. We find that these local churches were organized for evangelism. The book of Acts certainly gives information regarding this, and if you'll take the time to read Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 28, you'll find the church at Antioch was certainly an evangelistic church, and it was committed to the aspect of soul winning. It was committed to the aspect of salvation of souls. And if we were to say in a, in a very abbreviated form, what's the work of the church? Oftentimes we'll say evangelism, edification, benevolence, more accurate to state that the work of the church is the salvation of souls. And salvation of souls is accomplished through evangelism, edification, and benevolence. That's why in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3, the elders had the, uh, a warrant given unto them, the authority given unto them, delegated to them of the Lord himself, that in taking care 
of his people. They were to bring about a proper edification or growth in those local churches. In fact, Peter puts away, 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 3, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall yield, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now, brethren, when you look at verse 2, and you see that the responsibility given to elders to feed the flock of God which is among them, certainly the invitation speaks with reference to the importance of edification. The building up the local church, as set forth in Ephesians chapter 4. And then we see the importance of benevolence. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, really tells us a great deal about how important benevolent work is. And while the treasury is authorized, the places of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, regarding the aspect of the work of the church, we find in particular here, Paul is talking about a benevolent work in the church. He says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come, and when I'm whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality into Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. The church was organized for evangelism, for edification, for benevolence. The church was also organized for discipline. Now, while fellowship extends beyond the local church, and whereby thus the withdrawal of the ship can extend beyond that of the local church, meaning that one church can withdraw fellowship from another local church. The aspect of actually administering discipline is found in the confines of the local church. Because of the nature of local autonomy, when it comes to unruly members where the aspect of corrective or punitive discipline is administered, it's done through the means of the local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 certainly would be indicative of such, wouldn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we read about this uh, brother who was caught up in the sin of fornication. And Paul says in verse 3, For I verily as absent in the body, but in the spirit have judged already as though I were present uh, concerning him that hath done so this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When ye are gathered together, ye who? Those brethren in Corinth. When they come to gather in collective fashion, as a functioning unit, when they're gathered together, what were they to do? They were to put him away. They were to deliver him Satan because he was guilty of sin, because he was impenitent. He, at verse 5, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so we find thus that local churches do exist. Uh, there is a distinction to be made between the universal aspect of the church because it's a saved relationship in Christ in which people are baptized. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. The Lord has people to that saved body when they obey the gospel. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. But when you go to the book of Acts chapter 9 and you read Paul going into Jerusalem, he is saved to identify himself with the church of Jerusalem. That is a local collective functioning unit. That distinction needs to be made. The universal church has no organization. The local church does. And so this evening when we talk about organizational error being Christ within the church, we're not talking about the universal church. It has no universal collective function. It has universal function, but it's an individual function. The collective function is limited to that of the local church. When we talk about error, we need to make a distinction between error is not individual into sin, error that is counter to the New Testament pattern that will lead people to sin against God. Let me know an illustration. Suppose there were two preachers, and one of them got up in the sermon from Acts chapter 8. He became confused, and he taught the truth regarding the version of the Ethiopian nobleman. He said that that Ethiopian nobleman baptized Philip. Well, obviously he'd be wrong. And all he would stand to be corrected. 
but they are, he taught would not necessarily lead him into sin. But another fellow from Acts chapter 8 gets up and denies baptism has anything to do with salvation. Both of those men taught her. But yet one of them was not, though it was wrong, though it needed to be corrected, though he taught error, the act of teaching that, though it was an accuracy, would not lead that man's soul in a dangerous situation and cause him to go to hell that of itself. Where a denial of baptism for the remission of sins would. And so this evening, the error we want to look at that perhaps some are teaching that certainly, obviously, some are teaching. Organizational error in the church, we're talking about, again, the local congregation, the collective functioning aspect of the church, which we mean, would simply mean the local church. There is error being taught out there, brethren, and by the very nature of it, because it's sinful, it does cause division, and it causes uh, fellowship to be disrupted amongst who are members of the church. The first error I'd like to talk about this evening briefly is the rejection of the development of scriptural elders. There are some brethren who even deny that men can qualify themselves and local churches can appoint those men to serve as elders. That's fatal error. Do you know why it's fatal error? Because when you read the Word of God, how the appointed elders have the responsibility to be the shepherds of the local flock, and they're to oversee these individuals, and they're to oversee collectively these individuals in the local church, and they are to uh, superintend over them for an individual to take the position that we should not have elders today that are qualified. That would be a denial of the New Testament pattern, and such would be sinful, and therefore such is going to promote a disfellowship among Christians. Notice what Luke records as he records the word. The Holy Spirit inspires him to write that Paul has preached Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. How can you do that if you don't have men who are serving in that capacity? Now, there's true, it's true that there are some people who don't qualify and certainly be appointed. But to say that there are men who will not qualify does not mean there are men who aren't qualified. Another error that's being taught that's fatal error, is error that says, well, we'll have an eldership, but we'll just pick whoever, whomever we desire. It doesn't make you whether qualified or not. And they may take the attitude, some brethren take the attitude that we, I, was, I didn't hear this personally, but a preacher told me this. I don't know if he was joking or was telling the truth. Sometimes it's hard to tell. <laughs> but, you know, he said he was talking about the appointment of elders in a local church, and one man's name was suggested. And the, the additional elders, uh, the, the original elders went to this man's wife and they were discussing the qualifications of elders. And they said, is your husband apt to teach? And she said, he ought to do anything. <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, that's the attitude brethren have, the authority of the Scriptures. And brethren, that's wrong. And people disregard the qualifications of elders. They're involving themselves in fatal error. And that's wrong. That's sinful. That will cause a disruption of fellowship among Christians. And then there is the problem of one man rule. Sometimes you will find that in such given situations, individuals who participate in such uh, uh, situations like that aren't necessarily elders. They may be individuals who refuse to allow an eldership to come into being because they know they're not qualified. And so they're going to do everything with their power to keep an eldership and being on it. It's not going to keep them from running in the local church. It may be a preacher. It may be that the elders have been appointed, and it may be that one fellow among a group of elders has, has so uh, elevated himself that he wants to exhort those elders and they won't listen to him, and so he exerts a control over them, and he becomes like that fellow that we read about over in Third John called the Octary. Third John verse 9, John wrote, I wrote unto the church, but the Diotrephes, who loveth to have eminence among them, are not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember the deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, that would, and casteth them out of the church. When an individual when one man seeks to rule a local church, 
and he ignores the New Testament regarding the plurality of elders, whether it be the preacher, whether it be one of the elders, or whether it simply be a leading man in the congregation who seeks to dominate and domineer and control the church, that's not subjugating oneself under the New Testament pattern of the will of God. Brethren, that is sinful. And it will cause division among brethren. It will cause fellowship to be broken. And we have to oppose such false doctrine. And then there's another aspect of organizational error that's taught, at least it has been in the past, where individuals teach the concept of evangelistic oversight. And I was go to first, or they rather they go to Titus chapter one, where Paul is writing to Titus. He says in verse five, "For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order." the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. And they misapply that passage. And they butcher it, and they take it out of its context. And they draw the conclusion that, therefore, the preacher, the evangelist, has authority over it. He can control it. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. When you look at Hebrews chapter 13, they're all way under the sun that we can come up with this view that elders, Elders are to be subjugated to preachers. How could they be overseers? How could they be uh, responsible for super being superintendents over a local church, being pastors, being shepherds over a local church, and have to run to the preacher and get his permission before they can do anything? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Well, that brings us up to another false doctrine that's caused division and that's caused fellowship to be broken. And that false doctrine teaches that elders lead only by example, and they have no authority insofar as the exercise of their God responsibilities in each local congregation. Well, friends, that flies in the face of what's been written in Hebrews chapter 13 and 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. I wish people would explain what the word rule means. Had one fellow say, you know, that's not a good translation. It should say, obey them that have the lead over you. Obey them that have the lead. Well, how can you lead some without having some authority over them? He meets himself coming back, doesn't he? And so we find that's a false doctrine. That's counter to the New Testament pattern. And because that's a rejection of the New Testament pattern, brethren, it's sinful. Second John, verse 9. And then, you know, there's, there's problems with the Euripides, and then every now and then you'll find problems with what I like to refer to as a diotrophina. <laughs> Sometimes women get out of hand. And don't misunderstand, I'm not anti-woman. My mother was a woman. <laughs> And I'm, I'm glad to say that I'm married to a woman. And I have a daughter that was, so I'm not a woman. And Paul was not a woman hater. But women are not given positive authority in the local church. Look at 1 Timothy in the second chapter. We find that Paul says in verse 11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. Friends, if an individual understands the basic meaning of what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it would be wrong for women to usurp authority over the men and in putting herself in a situation uh, where they would be in capacities an overseer, a pastor, an elder, a bishop in the local church, those women would be usurping authority over men, and therefore they would be guilty of sin. First Peter chapter 3 gives the qualifications of elders and deacons. And, you know, if you read this very carefully, you will find that there's no way that a woman can meet the qualifications. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It doesn't say if people, if a man, verse 2, if a bishop, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, no way that scripturally a woman can have one wife. I know there's some they would like to. And I know perhaps our government in some areas, some state governments, and some in our federal government would like to make it where women 
can be husbands of wives, but God will never authorize that. And so thereby, thereby when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's no way a woman can, can meet the qualifications to serve on the ownership. And then there's another false doctrine. And that false doctrine is that uh, uh, you don't need uh, elders. You, you just have a, a committee to lead. Uh, you, people get these committees, and all that is just a convenient way of trying to work women into a leadership position where the Bible plainly says they're not authorized to be there and they have no right to be there. And then there's another false doctrine regarding the organists in the local church, and that is where people attempt to organize the universal extension of the church into a collective functioning unit. And someone says, well, I'm, what do you mean? How do they go about doing that? And they will frankly admit that there's no pattern in the New Testament. There's no setup where God has given direction how you go about doing it. And so they start using their own imagination, and they come up with a human organizations, end up with various parachurch works, where in organizing these, these particular functioning units, they're operative under a human arrangement, and they're accomplishing what the local needs to be doing, and they, in essence, overstep their grounds, and they start performing works that the local church should be doing, and they start having local churches function through them. And they'll draw all kinds of uh, uh, situations that are not parallel. I had a fellow tell me one, I said, well, you all use a motel when you have a gospel meeting. Or you'll have sent people to the hospital and you paid their hospital bills. Yes, but that's local uh, uh, human organizations working through the church. When people try to organize the church in its in a universal extension and formulate human organizations, they have the, the church and through those human organizations. It's not even a parallel situation. And besides, there's a vast difference in making a contribution and in purchasing a service. When we, uh, when we uh, put a preacher in a hotel and we pay the motel bill, all we're doing is purchasing a service. We don't send money over to the local hotel and say, spend, you have a desire to spend, and use as you desire to use it. We don't do that, friends. And then another problem that we're facing in the work of the church, another perversion of Bible teaching is the centralization of local work or region or the hood eldership. Now, I want it to be understood very clear tonight, friends. I am not opposing the cooperation of churches. I do not stand in opposition to the cooperation of churches in the area of evangelism, in the area of benevolence, or in the area of edification. In fact, when you look at what the Scriptures teach, as we find that local churches cooperated in the first century regarding that of local benevolence, the principle that authorizes church, one church to send funds from its treasury to the treasury of another local church, in a benevolent implication would also authorize a local church to send funds from its treasury to another local faithful local New Testament church in an evangelistic need or in a need for edification. If we take the position that some brethren have and as some brethren do, that local church is authorized to cooperate in benevolence, but not in evangelism, they're really saying, they may not realize it, they're implying that God has a greater concern for our physical needs than he does our spiritual needs. And of course that would be ridiculous. I go back to where, uh, to use the illustration, when he healed a sick man, a palsied man, I believe it's palsied, no, the man the withered hand over in Matthew chapter 12, they condemned him for doing that on the Sabbath. And he, raised, he reasoned from the lesser to the greater. He raised the question, if you have an animal and if it falls in the ditch on the Sabbath day, are you not going to go pull that animal out? And from reasoning the procedure, he thus concluded it was right to heal on the Sabbath day. Well, the same thing when it comes to church cooperation. If it's right for a local church, to send money to another local church in a benevolent, then why, upon the same basis, cannot one church send money to another faithful local New Testament church for an evangelistic need or regarding that of edification? That's not the problem. The problem is when brethren become all excited and lose their common sense and reasoning capacity, and that cooperation ceases to be cooperation, 
and it becomes centralization where you have one eldership in a region, or it just may be in a brotherhood, where they want to start bossing churches, saying, you're going to have to do this, you're going to have to do that. And they start using high pressure and techniques. And if you don't support us, you know, you're good, but a bunch of knees. If you don't support us, uh, we're going to let people know you're a bunch of cranks there. And we bought this program up, we've designed this work, and uh, it's an obligation you have to financially support it, and you're going to have to promote it. And don't tell me that kind of pressure doesn't go on. When one eldership will seek to withdraw another eldership, another local congregation, upon the basis of those individuals standing for truth, brethren, that is a prime example of individuals seeking to overstep their bound and have a greater influence among local churches than what they should have. And they will start emphasizing their program of work to the point where if you don't force it, if you part it, you're sinning before God. They've taken something of an optional nature and made a requirement out of it. And that's binding where it hasn't bound, and that's sinful, that's wrong, and we stand in opposition to it. It causes division. It causes division. It causes uh, individuals to have a breach among brethren and folks that is wrong. Well, the question is raised, should the organizational error within the church cause a disruption of fellowship? Yes. Why? Because of the nature of the New Testament pattern. If a person gets up and rejects the New Testament pattern concerning the plan of salvation, it's not that sinful. If a person teaches a faith-only doctrine, it's not that sinful. If a person affirms that uh, salvation is not contingent upon baptism, it's not that sinful. What about if an individual rejects the pattern regarding that of New Testament worship? And they affirm that it's right for instruments of music to be brought in. Is not that sinful? What if individuals or if local churches teach that uh, the pattern for the work of the church can just totally amount? And we shouldn't be concerned about evangelism, edification, and evidence. We just use whatever works. We just engage in following whatever will draw a crowd. Is not simple. We would appeal to second verses 9 through 11. We would appeal to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 that whatever we do in word or deed must be all done and accomplished upon the authority of Christ. And when individuals reject the pattern concerning salvation, when individuals reject the pattern concerning worship, when individuals can reject the pattern concerning work, that results in sin. All you stop and you think about it now. What about the reaffirmation and reevaluation concept that's being advocated by Dave Miller and those who are in agreement with him? Someone says, well, you have to get men who are not qualified. Well, get rid of them. They shouldn't be there anyway. The church has to remove them. Look, brethren. If a local church has the right to appoint qualified men, they have the right to disappoint unqualified men. If not, why not? That's not the issue. And these brethren who are affirming this doctrine are noted for running around making flanking movements and throwing up smoke screens and not dealing with the issue, and they're not dealing with the issue on this, and they won't deal with the issue on this, and the reason they deal with the issue on this is because they can't deal with the issue on this. We're not talking about removing unqualified men from the elders. We're talking about individuals who get a wrinkle in their system somewhere. Uh, they get their hair lotted up in a knot and they can't get it taken down. And they become angry and want to remove men who are authorized men to serve on the eldership. And so they come up with arbitrary views and arbitrary activity, saying if you don't at least have 7% members of the congregation, that are agreement for an elder to be serving as an elder, though he qualified, and those perhaps those men or those in that weren't even members of the congregation when he's appointed, but they can just arbitrarily remove him. That's ridiculous. That's the tail wagging the dog. And I would shudder to think what would happen in most congregations if this doctrine were successfully practiced and faithful local men serving as elders and local congregations were removed, we would be at the mercy of every heretic, every crank, every weirdo, every crackpot and psycho ceramic that come along. That's true. That's true. Psycho ceramic, that's just Latin for crackpot. <laughs> but uh, you stop and think about this. We can see that the centralization of cooperative works would be wrong. 
We can see that organizing the universal aspect of the church would be wrong. We can see that Diotrephes and Diotrephenes are wrong. We can see that unqualified men being appointed as elders is wrong. We can see that the rejection of the concept of even having elders today is wrong. Upon the ba same basis that we would do such as being sinful because it's not authorized by the Scriptures, we have to conclude that the concept of the reovation and reaffirmation of elders is unauthorized. And because it's not authorized in the Word of God, such is wrong. I'd like to conclude our thoughts this evening in the book of 1 John. And noting in, in verse 6 of chapter 1, what John has to say, writing that of fellowship. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Brethren, when organizational error is found within the Lord's church, and I mean organizational error, I'm talking about error that's people into sin, that by very nature brings about a disruption in fellowship among Christians. Thank you. May God bless you. The fact of the matter is that the uh, very thing that qualifies one to be an elder also disqualifies one to be an elder. And these arbitrary uh, um, methodologies that are employed to disqualify elders are contrary to scriptures and they ought to be opposed and we are doing that, opposing uh, that. Uh, truth has truth unite people. We keep on truth, but truth can also divide people. And those who are opposed to that truth are the occasion for that division. So let's keep that in mind. I'm, I might have just a kind of a personal love. Uh, and that you know, the trip. You know, Nancy was so impressed with. It, he said she just could squeeze you to death. <laughs> I never had that problem. <clears throat> but I would say that uh, there are others who, by any means, will achieve the same end. Yes. We really appreciate uh, the fine lesson that you presented. And in fact, we appreciate all the fine lessons that have been uh, presented uh, so far, and we certainly look forward to the, the uh, final presentation this evening. Those of you that uh, would like to have a permanent record of this uh, lectureship, uh, we ask that you fill out one of these forms that uh, Brother Green has. He has uh, various formats that you can choose. And I think that would be a welcome addition to your uh, library that you can view it from time to time. And also the book that's on sale in the back, uh, that would be a, a great addition to your library also. Uh, those of uh, that uh, or listening to the uh, over the internet, if you'd like to view it again at some later date, and it's being archived, and you can uh, go to churcheschrist.com and follow the appropriate links. That uh, can conclude this uh, evening session. We'll turn now for about uh, oh, about five minutes until the top of the hour, and then we'll uh, introduce our last speaker of the uh, session.